banditos. Welcome to another episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits. I'm Mike Farah. And yes, we know you are thirsting for less solo interviews. I know you want to see us all back together. And we will be, I promise. But we do have a few more solo interviews to go. And one of them is today. It is a Mike on the Mic interview. And it is with Alex Maliev. Uh, you know Alex. I know you know Alex from uh, his work with primarily Brian Michael Bendis. He, you may know him probably from Daredevil, um, where he had a humongous, like, genre-defining run, I'd say, with uh, BMB. And before that, you know him from Sam and Twitch, uh, where he really um, cut his teeth. And after that, it was Moon Knight and Scarlet, which was their creator-owned book. And now the dynamic duo is back with Masterpiece from Dark Horse. It comes out today, the first issue. So go out there, go to your local comic book shop, be sure to pick it up and you will enjoy it. But for now, let's talk to Alex Maliv. And that is Alex Maliv. Alex, how are you? I'm doing a little um, fine, uh, considering that we had a long comic book convention and everybody caught a bug or there was something going on. People are complaining, so I'm a little tired, but uh, I'm doing good. Yeah, there's definitely something going around. It's uh, not just from the comic convention. Um, it just seems to be that time of year. But it's uh, COVID. Well, it's COVID. It's <laughs> it's COVID. It's COVID time all over again. People are testing positive. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll we'll try to keep this on the short side and make sure that uh, you get your rest. Um, but uh, we're going to start you out with the usual question that we always start out with, which is how and when did you first discover comic books? There was a magazine uh, called Pif, P-I-F, a French published magazine, uh, which was at the time when I was growing up in Bulgaria, that's behind the Iron Curtain. So uh, there were no mess Western uh, media magazines or anything like this allowed on the newsstands, only Russian propaganda, and of course some Bulgarian propaganda. But uh, Pif, for some reason, uh, was allowed um, to be imported from France. And I think it's only because the publisher of the magazine and someone from France will probably correct me now, but I think the publisher of the magazine was either connected to a communist party or something like this. So our uh, censorship allowed this for a reason to, to come to Sofia, to Bulgaria, and it was in the newsstand. So um, it was my first exposure to comics. Um, when I was probably 15, 16 years old. This magazine used to have a toy in it, which you can uh, assemble yourself at home, like a little, uh, something like you will find in the um, those chocolate Kinder eggs. I don't know if you... Oh, yeah. 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 So it's like a little thing with instruction. You can assemble this in home, and uh, we kids wanted to go after the toys. So we got the magazine. Uh, it was all in French. Nobody spoke French, of course, because only Russian and Bulgarian were allowed in the country as the mandatory languages, of course. And um, we just look at the pictures. That's uh, the drawings. That's the first time I saw a comic book uh, magazine in my life. And you didn't have, I, I would imagine you probably have not kept any of those magazines they oh were really... i did yes you did not, you still not, have them? not not only that i did and uh i have some somewhere uh in one of my drawers because especially the old ones the the ones that we were getting at the time were not that good i think the much or the black and white ones the older ones from the 60s and the 70s those were the good ones those were th those were the ones that you will have like the top French artists uh, drawing comics, black and white, newsprint paper, amazing stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like maybe I do. It, it, I, it, I'll disappear if you want me to. You, you speak for a little while, and I can come back with the magazine. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you. You know, if you sneak away, I'll just kind of vamp for a while. And uh, no, 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 no. I'm I'm not going to do this. To you. <laughs> so but, uh, um, yes, I do. I do. And I I I think that I didn't bring them with me when I came. But I think uh, in one of my later trips to Bulgaria, I either took them with me back or I had my dad send them to me 
those are good. Like this is real stuff. It's it's amazing artists in in, in those magazines. Amazing artists. And did that plant a seed in your mind that that's it, something it, that you could possibly it, it, do as a profession? It, it uh, it's hard to say because I looked at it as as not a sequential art as much because again we couldn't read the uh, the balloons. It would, I couldn't decipher the French language. I cannot do it either now, <laughs> uh, 40 years later. But um, to me, th those were just illustrations. And I was looking at the the artwork more than I was looking at the story. Mm -hmm. And maybe planted the seed in my, in my brain that an illustrator could do this as well, not just illustrations. Um, so I studied... Um, Illustration. I studied um, in the high school of arts and an academy of fine arts, and I graduated in printmaking. Um, but it, I was working in black and white most of the time. I, I do a lot of color, uh, watercolors, and paintings now. But back in the day, it was just pen and ink, and and working on the printing press. So that black and white magazine maybe connected that in a way to what I was doing in the um, well, I was a student and maybe, I don't know. I didn't think about it. I don't know. Maybe I'll answer that question tomorrow. Okay. We'll come back to that. But yeah, uh, you know what I mean? It, it could be. I mean, I don't know. It could be. Yeah. I mean, I... I There's a connection there, right there. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the, the, the sort of black and white aesthetic and um, and then going to sort of printmaking. Um, maybe there's sort of a continuity of uh, yeah. from the the comics the initial comics to the uh what you were studying and then and then it gets back to comics uh, you know uh, I, I know you're sort of looking for this um yeah when i looking did, for these I, comics I but... somewhere on top but i don't see them yeah so yeah i can't show you the magazines sadly anyways so we'll so you on. were you were educated in in the fine arts right mm -hmm. and you came out with um you know a discipline of printmaking um, it, it was this something you at the time thought, you know, I'm going to do something in the fine arts arena, or did you almost immediately oh, say like, comics? No, no, absolutely. This was the goal. Of course. Uh, I don't think at the time it crossed my mind that I'll be, uh, drawing comics for most of, most of my career. Um, it just happened that way. I mean, um, was I hoping that I'll be exhibiting, uh, prints, which I still see. I have some on the wall. Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. No, not bad. A little bit of glare. Yeah. A little bit of glare, but no, overall, I can see it. See, this is from 1994. And this was from the time I was um, printing at the Academy. This is what I was hoping I'll be doing for the rest of my life. But it's hard to pay the bills with this. I was going to so ask I, the question. I was, I was why, why didn't yeah. it become? But. That, that's a good to, reason. It's hard to pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, even now, it's hard to pay the bills. Um, I could have been a struggling artist for the rest of my life, uh, or I could have explored another venue, um, and one of them was drawing comics. And do you think the but the fine arts background and the printmaking, I, I, even just looking at the example you just showed mm -hmm. me, really seems to have informed your comics work. You're one of uh, a number of artists, I would say, a few, a very rare number of artists that I could see having a sort of fine arts career. Like someone like you, someone like Bill Sienkiewicz, um, mm -hmm. it's just, um, there's, for lack of a better word, artistry <laughs> to to your art. Um, did that, so did you pull through, when, when you finally got into comics, were you pulling through sort of your your um, background and your um, printmaking and artistic, you know, fine arts uh, skills into the comics? What else was I going to lean on? I mean, the, yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's all I knew how to do. Um, I, I suppose that it, it, I use this as a basis to uh, develop a style in some way because I was think about it. We didn't have the the American superhero comics back in Bulgaria, so I was. Mm -hmm not influenced by any of the art that, you know, people grew up here with. Uh, so, you know, when, when uh, fans refer to, to comics from the 70s and the 80s, even in the 90s, um, to me, this is just 
what are you talking about? Like, I don't, I, I had no idea. So I had to educate myself on the history of comics in, in the States just to get a better idea of, of, of what the field is like, you know, the rough waters I'm going to swim in, I need to know how to swim. Um, so all of that stuff was unfamiliar to me. And in the beginning, I can only rely on what I've learned in the academy, which is a, a sort of a style that I was developing. Um, again, would this have been the style that I'd be using now had I been a uh, fine art printmaking? I don't know. But it did help me, yeah, for sure. It I did also re read that you went to the Kubert School once you yeah, came I over did for to a little bit for the first. I think it was for the first four months. Uh, when I came to the States was the first school that I, I mean, I was accepted to the school and, and I got a student visa and that's how I came. Uh, but it was suggested to me from some of the um, teachers at the school and even I spoke to Joe at the time. And uh, they said, just get out of here and then get a job. There's really nothing we can uh, do f for you. <laughs> you can go. So they gave me a phone number or a couple of phone numbers. And uh, some of the um, teachers at the school really did help me uh, make a connection with some editors. And that's how it started. When you were looking at the Kubert School, w were you thinking, you know, I have some history to learn about i have something to learn about this art form um of that course. i yes yeah. and, and, and uh, back in the day they would think about this is before the internet so there's no web page you can go to and, and and look at everything i had a someone had, had brought in brochure from somewhere and uh it's like a printed magazine you, you you look through some of the art that some of the students at the school had and then of course i'm looking at joe kubert stuff and his style of illustration drew me into this. I, I, I felt that I can learn to, to do something like this, of course. Um, had I stayed there for four years, I'm sure I would have learned more things. But being on the field and, and winging it for a little while, I suppose, uh, taught me how to do it better. It, it, the pressure was on. Yeah. I mean, you got some pretty good early assignments too, like coming out of the yeah, school, yeah, right? Yeah. You were well, the be, crow. Before, before you think of the crow, I did some work at the um at Valiant and I did Arabian Nights and Magic the Gathering. You know, those were the first, first, very first jobs that I got. So even before that I cut my teeth in <laughs> in some interesting works. Yeah. And, and what did you, you know, you spoke about that you were learning on the job. I mean, what are the kinds of things that you were learning in those early assignments? Storytelling. Yeah. Storytelling I was learning. I mean, I, I, I had a good understanding of, of anatomy, um, but most of it was storytelling. How to fit everything on one page in six, seven panels. Yeah. And I, I did learn some of that at Joe Kubert School, but then the rest of it is just me with some some of the artists that was that were working at Valiant at the time. Uh, we were just working together through the nights. Uh, we slept through the day and worked all night at the at the studio, in the offices of Valiant, mind you. Um, so we would just sit together um, all night and and look at each other's art. And that's how you learn from different people. From you know, people help me. I mean, you, it, comic strikes me as a type of medium, maybe all media are, but that you have to, you have to do, you have to make comics in order to know how to make comics. You have to, it's, same thing with cooking. You can, you can read a recipe and and, and picture right. how you're going to make this. You got to sit behind the stove and just, you know, turn on the, turn on the burner and uh, see what happens. You have to learn. And I still learn every day. Like every, every time I draw something, I learn something. If this is a process that never ends. I read that you had an early experience with um, storyboarding mm -hmm. on the Lost in Space movie. Is this around? Is this around the around the time when you're doing this early work in comics? And did no, that, that, that also that was, okay. that was, that was later. later? This one, I can't tell you which year that was. We did the uh, Lost. Uh, it, was it called Lost in Space? The Tim Allen's movie, right? Is that what it was? Oh, uh, that was Galaxy Quest. So may have I may have no, gone. No, 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 no. 
there was something else with it. We did the um, oh, wait, I worked no. with a studio and I, I drew, I, I don't think I did um, Lost in Space. I did um, my first one was The Great Expectations. Great Expectations, uh, Alfonso Coron made that one. Uh, then I oh. did uh, The Bone Collector with Philip Noise. And I did a few other ones afterwards, but those were the two major ones. Mm -hmm. And working with these great directors, of course, it helped me do some. Uh, I, I, again, I worked um, for maybe a month and a half to two months uh, under great expectations, and I worked with Alfonso almost every day, sitting together at the table, just drawing for him. Did I learn a lot from that? Oh, hell yeah. A lot. Did you learn a lot that you could then apply to further Absolutely. your story telling yeah, in comics? Yeah, not just that. I mean, uh, since then, when I lay out comics, I I do them in a storyboard style. Hmm. Like I I don't I don't draw the page the layout of the page with the panels like other artists would do. Right. Uh, I I just draw them horizontally, and then I cut them up. Afterwards, uh, from the horizontal page, I, I mean, I even had um, I was looking at this, and I had the uh, the drawings of the Spider Woman uh, comic book, and I went through my stuff upstairs, and I saw all of them that they're they're just storyboards, storyboards, storyboards for the whole comic. That's really they're, they're done in that format. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you've used that. Yeah, have you used? Basically, since you started storyboarding, you've used that as your sort of structural. More or less, aid. yes. Now, yeah. like, nowadays, I don't. I wouldn't. Um, back then, I would print out a page with three to four panels, horizontal panels, sixteen by nine uh, ratio, and I would just draw on that. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I just draw on top of the script um, as it's printed out. Uh, I do the, the actual drawings like done like this. Well, this actually is masterpiece number three, so I'm not supposed to show you the script. <laughs> All right, from a distance, though. It's okay. not close enough. Yeah, from a distance. This, this yeah, is yeah. what it looks like. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. I draw directly onto the script. And I'm sure other artists do the same thing. Is that partially to get your sort of first instinctual thought from reading it so that you're not like overthinking it probably yeah probably i can imagine but then Is... again if you do if you do this um uh once you start laying out the page um and you you take the drawings from the script you can see which ones of course you gotta blow up which ones you gotta shrink which ones you gotta cut uh, and you do the actual design of the page Afterwards, I already have the snip. I mean, I, I have the, the snippets of, of, of the images, and I just paste them together like a puzzle piece. Does it make sense? Yeah, totally. All right. All right. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, is, is storyboarding something you like to do more of? If you were given the opportunity, I I I still get calls for that. Yeah, uh, and I give them the fuck you rate, <laughs> so they leave me alone. <laughs> Would I do it? I would do it if I were 20 years younger. Because yeah. it's it's storyboarding a movie is very taxing. Yeah. They can call you in the middle of the night and right. you gotta be there. Yeah. It's because the director had that day full of stuff that you need to do. They had a meetings, had a, a shots, had dailies, watched them, whatever they did. Right. Then all of a sudden at 12 30, when you're about to go to bed. You get a call and they say there's a car waiting for you downstairs. It'll take you to Soho, and you can work until six o'clock in the morning. You have no chance to, to say no, though. It's it's your wow. job. So yeah. would I do this now? Absolutely not. No. Yeah, yeah I, I can imagine. So there there are millions of dollars on the line, and they're sort of like whatever uh -huh. it takes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, got it. All right. So back to comics. Um, back to comics. Uh, you know, one of your you had a number of big breaks, but one of your big breaks, especially with your most frequent collaborator, was Sam and Twitch mm -hmm. uh, with Brian Michael Bendis. Would love to know how that came about and would also love to know um, as a follow up. And we can I'll remind you of the follow ups in case you forget it is sort of, you know, did you hit it off immediately with Brian? Because it seems like it became such a professional relationship that that yes, we did. 
Uh, simple answer is that. Um, how did that happen? It's a good question. Maybe Brian would be able to answer this better. But I think, and it could be corrected, but I think that uh, Todd McFarlane put us together. Right. I think I got a call from Todd, and uh, he suggested I do this book. And and Todd and I had developed a relationship from before, and I, I don't remember how. I think we met at one of the cons, maybe San Diego, and, and he always liked my art. So he wanted to have me do something for him. And I, I guess when Brian um, came with Sam and Twitch with the idea of, of, of how this book is going to go, Todd thought of me. Maybe thought of someone else that wasn't available. I like to think that it was just me. Uh, but that's how we came together. And um, that relationship continued afterwards at Marvel Knights. Um, yeah. Daredevil. I was going to ask, were you were you both sort of recruited as a team to Daredevil? No, I think Brian was, uh, he got that job first. And I think he talked to uh, Joe, uh, Joe Casada and Joe... I think I got a call from Joe or Nancy. I'm not sure. But no, if it was from Joe. Um, and um, I, I said immediately yes to this, of course. I, I had no idea what was what was supposed to come out of this. It, what it become is beyond my wildest imagination. But when I said yes, I just wanted to work with Brian. <laughs> That's, yeah. and that was the idea. How familiar were you with the character um obviously you've now been in you know the u.s at this point for for quite for a little few while years. yeah yeah um and so you're sort of picking up obviously history of comics and characters mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that but uh you know obviously ben this was a big draw but were you like daredevil yay or daredevil who is that <laughs> it was pretty much daredevil who is that <laughs> i mean of course i i knew how he looked like but I didn't know much details about him. I had to, you know, study on the side a little bit to to know what I was getting myself into. Uh, but at the time, no, I wasn't. I was not very familiar with the character at all, which probably helped in a way that it kept me isolated from what it's been done before, right? Yeah. And it just it gave me a, an open venue where I can create stuff by myself. You think that this is a—it's just a process born out of, uh, of ignorance, I suppose. <laughs> well, it goes back to your when we were talking about your style, right? So you—you you weren't necessarily influenced by you know this whole history and some might say baggage of comic books. You're yeah. doing your own thing, and then applying that to something that has been around for a while, mm -hmm. but still doing it your own way. So um, I, I think not having that knowledge and history and baggage to weigh you down probably is in very freeing. Run. Yeah, in a long yeah. run, it was liberating. You're right, yeah. Yeah. Maybe um, I just got lucky. Just got lucky. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. true. You know, we oftentimes in these interviews, it does come up at some point that, you know, how much um, luck plays a role in how things go in comics and in other parts of life. But... Um, you know, you can't underestimate the, the sort of the value of luck, uh, well, although this, you have quite is, a big talent as well. This, this is, thank you, but this is because you you interview people who have somewhat succeeded. If you interview right. people who have failed, then uh, they will not speak about that luck in, in such a, a, you know, glaring, <laughs> well, complimentary may, ways, you know. True. They may speak about not having that luck. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it'd be the, the, the opposite of the fence. Um, so this was, you know, a critically lauded uh, run on Daredevil. Um, well deserved, obviously. When you were in the middle of it, though, and doing the book month to month, did you, did you know that this was something special, that this was sort of a, almost a one of a kind? No, I had no idea. Project? Uh, to me, the most important thing was to get it right, um, make it look good, and, and get it on time. Because we were doing 12 to 14 issues a year, and all of that had to come out on time, and I didn't miss deadlines. So I was so swamped with work that I had no idea 
you know, when you put this together and people bring the omnibus now at conventions, this whole like huge brick yeah. of work. And when I see it and I go, I drew this whole thing. I, I just, I still can't grasp that as an accomplishment. It's, it's incredible that, you know, how many years was it? Four years, three, four years. So it's like 60 something issues. Yeah. No, I had no idea what I was getting myself into something like that. Absolutely not. So in the middle of it, you're just trying to get it done. I'm trying to get it done. Down, I, got, like I got a deadline. I'm, I'm getting like we're we're we're, yeah. we're double uh, uh, shipping this this month. We need two issues, not one. And like I, I got to do an issue in, in in nine to ten days. It yeah. was insanity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the cover. And the cover, right? And exactly. The cover. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that was a time. Back then, I mean, you know, obviously there's still artists that are doing the cover, but there's so, you know, so many variants uh, now that you don't sometimes know mm -hmm. who's actually doing the cover. But your covers um, for also doing the interior art were so evocative uh, that um, it's almost easy to overlook because you you were also doing the interiors and it was just such of a piece with each other. But the covers were so good on their own that it's... Um, it's just frankly astonishing. <laughs> it was not intentional. Trust me, it was not. Just, it just worked that way. Well, that's a great. I mean, <laughs> it just worked out. Kudos. Way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you went on to obviously they had this amazing run on Daredevil. You had Sam and Twitch before that with Bendis, and then further products, and and then we're going to get to masterpiece. What do you think makes the, your collaboration with Brian so? Um, fruitful and successful i feel comfortable i just feel comfortable uh, drawing his scripts it's, it's as simple as that when i get another script and, and i read it and i just don't see the format the way i'm like i'm used to seeing it from the daredevil days and it just something is off when i read brian's script like i can immediately picture it in my head um because he he writes it in su such a cinematic way that it, it just does not require me to do much more. I'm, I'm sure Brian will give me uh, a credit for, of course, like visualizing some of the things that he does. But I'm telling you, like, if you read the script, it's like a film script. Like immediately, like mm -hmm. I would compare this to the work with, I did in, um, as a storyboard artist. Uh, it just makes me feel comfortable. It, it, as arrogant as it would sound, it just, it's easier that way. You know, it's just easier. Mm -hmm. You guys have a rhythm. A, a, there is a rhythm there. I mean, I don't know yeah. how other artists feel about his scripts, but I, he claims, and I tend to believe him, I want to believe him, of course, that he writes it for me. When he writes a script, he writes it for the uh, to the strength uh, of the artists. So there, there's direct references. When I read the script, there's direct references to me in it or to the things I know that he knows that I know that I can relate to. Um so in some way, yes, of course he writes it for me. Yeah. And, guys... I draw, and I draw it, I draw the script for him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't right. just draw it for myself. I, I draw it because I know he's gonna see it. So what when is... he when he challenges me to do something in the book, uh, which he did a lot in Scarlet, um, asking me to use different styles, art styles or create something that no one's ever seen before and then shit like that usually. Uh, I, I know that he's going to look at this um, and I, I, I'm not asking, I'm, I'm trying to please him in a way as a creator too, because it's, it, we're collaborating this thing together. So when he, when he writes it, he expects to see the same amount of effort or more from the other side yep. as he should. So in a way, I draw the, the scripts, I draw them for him as well. Well, you want to make him proud and you want to do no, his I want to make him happy, not proud. justice. Yeah. He doesn't have to be proud of me. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough. <laughs> He's, not You're a big boy. He's not my parent. <laughs> but I want to make him happy. I want him yeah. to see it and, and go, fuck, he did it again. <laughs> <It's> good. <laughs> I'm sure he does. If we, we get a chance to talk to him, I'll, I'll ask him <laughs> if that's the exact exclamation yeah, he yeah. has when he sees the uh, pages. Um, so, as I said, you guys worked on a lot of um, uh, Marvel properties and also, well, I guess it was sort of Marvel Halo. Um, 
And then I wanted to talk to you about Scarlet and Masterpiece because those are um, more independent uh, books. But so when you were on the Marvel titles, was there um, a specific approach when you took on a new character? Like when you took on Spider-Woman, when you took on um, Moon Knight that you guys you know, you're like, here's what we want to do. I, I hesitate to use the word formula, but you're like, uh, you know, what we do is we take this character and lay him on its side or do a serious um, dive into their psyche. Now, I mean, that's, there... that's a question you need to ask Brian. Yeah. Because he knows the answer to that. Uh, on my side, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make him look and behave like humans. Okay. Like someone you will see on the subway, someone that you know, um, it'll remind you of some someone that you've seen in school or something like like a human being. They don't look like um, a cartoon characters, and that mm-hmm. this is a, this is the reason why uh, when I did this with Daredevil, I used a lot of a lot of my friends, family, uh, random people, some actors as well as models. And that continued on for most of the books that we did with Brian. Uh, I relied on, on the references of different people because especially with Daredevil, think about it. We had over 60-something issues. We had so many characters in them, so many, and recurring characters. So they had to look the same throughout the whole run. Same thing with Scarlet, same thing with uh, Spider-Woman, Moon Knight, uh, not as much Halo, but um, even uh, same thing with uh, Masterpiece. We, we're going to get to that too. Uh, but Scarlet, for example, was um, I used uh, an actress to be my model. I did the same thing with Spider Woman. These are real people. So, what was your question again? Why am I going that direction? Yeah, well, that that's what I was I was aiming at doing is I wanted to make them look like real people. That's that's the answer. Yeah. So I would hire people to pose for me. And of course, my wife, who is somewhere downstairs and hopefully not listening to this whole thing, she's been like in every book since the beginning. Like she was um, Mila, Matt Murdock's wife. Mm-hmm. And she went on to be um, a model for... 20 something years for a lot of the characters. Lucky to have her. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it seems like the, the, the theme here, if there is a theme, is, is realism. Realism. It's bringing these characters who can be oftentimes larger than life down to earth and put them mm-hmm. in sort of these, these real situations. Um, one thing that strikes me is, uh, and I wonder how you work or don't work um, with the colorist on all of these, because it seems that the, the color oftentimes very much complements your um, your artwork and, and is, you know, sort of lends to the to the realism and as well as sort of your, your style of which I consider a little bit more painterly. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a big um, part of how you work? Do you work with the colorist closely? Yes, or is I do, it... but I work with Matt Hollingsworth. Uh for I don't know how many issues, hundreds of issues, and, and Dave Stewart. Like, I've worked with the best people in the business. Yeah. And Matt and I, and 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 Dave not as much, but Matt and I uh, developed a friendship over the years. Uh, and I know Dave, too, very well. But um, with Matt, we would, in the beginning, I'll just tell him, you know, just just give me textures. I want, I want textures. Uh, and, and do whatever you want. And, and a lot of the... Um, like I'll rarely I will go and 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 make them fix something that I feel like could have been different. But ninety nine percent of the time, the colorists do their their own thing. You know, I, I'm see I'm fortunate enough to have worked with the best. Yeah. So in the beginning of a project, if I want to have a different approach to the artwork, because I change, uh, I change styles quite often, and sometimes I have textures in the art in the line art like i did uh during the daredevil years i'm trying to clean up now so mm-hmm. i'm asking because i've cleaned up on masterpiece i'm asking for flat colors and more bold choices uh and again to 
still I'm into the texture stuff a lot. That's probably because of my printmaking years. Um, but I do let the colorists do a lot of the work themselves. Like I'll go back and, and ask for small changes, but I'm, I'm not overly anal about <laughs> what they right. do. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of the S that way. <laughs> I, I I like the um the, the word and the concept of textures because that that very much encapsulates uh, uh what I like about um a lot of the your art and how it you know comes across on the page that it's that it is not just one dimensional or two dimensional. There there are these textures in, in, in the search of textures. I mean, this is like a like an addiction on my part because I would I would go nowadays when I when I draw a lot of the commissions and some covers, I would go out of my way just to find a way to create a different texture and and using all kinds of different materials, um, searching for 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 how the the pigments and the papers and and the media reacts together and 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 the effects that it gives me using charcoals, liquid charcoals, watercolors, granulating materials, everything you can possibly imagine, just, just to get something that is unique, you know? Um, and it feels more alive that way, too, I think. Mm. So bringing life to the page is not just using real people to post for you. It's just a lot of other things that make it organic, analog. Yeah. Stay away from the digital stuff as much as you can. Got it. Like if oh, you if yeah. you if you if you look at it, you can't see it, but if you see my uh, hi-fi stereo, I, I got two amps and I have a turntable and everything is analog over there. Yeah, <laughs> I stay away from the digital stuff. Um, and there's just so much more life to it. Um, te you know, speaking of textures, that's exactly probably you get so much more texture from the music uh, for those analog mm -hmm, means. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, a that's if, a if you know what you're talking about, about then, then yeah. yes, you know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a you know it's a, it's a it's a topic for a different podcast altogether. <laughs> um, so let's talk about um, masterpiece, but I, I wanted to talk about a little bit in concert with Scarlet as well, being that they're both independent and sort of creator owned um, comics. You know yeah. what what is different in the approach to these that compared to uh, pre-existing characters, like compared to Daredevil and some of your other Marvel work, uh, when you get something that is completely new, are you, um, are you like, you know, psyched about being able to create a, a sort of a new world, new characters and things, or um, are you missing some sort of reference? No, no, you, you, you nailed it right there. This is, you, you are creating a new world. That's the thing. Because in the DC Marvel universe, you're dealing with stuff that's already been established. Whereas with Scarlet, you know, we broke the world in that um, in that comic book. I mean, what what he did was revolutionary at the time. I think because it just predicted what the future is going to be. Well, Portland was not cut off by uh, military, and the the bridges were not broken. But what had happened, mind you, this was before. Uh, Occupy World, uh, Wall Street, Wall Street. Yeah. even happened. Like all these riots and, and uh, protests and all that stuff before Black Lives Matter, all that was just years. He was years ahead of the time. Years ahead. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And, yeah. and, and, and we, when we made it, it was uh, um, uh, like people didn't really pay attention to it. And all of a sudden when it happened, it was like... Um, it's a hot topic. Like we don't touch this because it's just too sensitive. I mean, look, it's it, 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 the studios didn't want to do it because people at the time were afraid to uh, go near that kind of stuff. It was too real. It was too yeah. real at the time when people wanted to have entertainment and something to relax about, you know, and 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 not another, uh, you know, the world's gonna end tomorrow. In, in and. <laughs> Which you know we're not far away from that <laughs> even now. It's like getting right. worse. <laughs> um, but in that respect, it was um, what it appealed to me was just designing a new world. That's what it was, which was based on the world that we already had. Right. Um, so it was a step in a step in a different direction. It had the greedy stuff. It had the the uh, 
something it had Hell's Kitchen, but on a on a national level. Um, and Portland, being the city where Brian lives, and I lived there for three years, I had enough references. Mm-hmm. Uh, I even went back um, when he wrote the script. I went back and I took a lot of um, photographs from all the areas where he set the scenes. So they're very true to 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 the location. Which is, I guess, something that it came from working in the movies because I used to go to location scouts with the um, a lot of the people, you know, and and with the art director. And I did use Hell's Kitchen and New York as a background for the Daredevil books, so people will actually recognize specific locations and come and tell me, "Oh, yeah, I used to live there," or "Or oh, this is my street," or "I know that deli." It, it was all real, and the same thing was uh, done in in. Scarlet. You'll see Powell's books. You'll see some other locations. You'll see the uh, downtown um, Pearl District. All that stuff was there. It happened. And a couple of years later, you got rats in Portland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how much was anticipated. It was anticipated. I don't know. If, just, I don't know if Brian. Uh, had a crystal ball maybe or yeah <laughs> or was it just his head no pun intended uh <laughs> but yeah he he got it right you know all, all those years of working with um on super powered individuals you know something may have seeped in and uh he has a little bit of the nostradamus to him <laughs> ask him ask him um, but I think the, you know, setting setting these books at real locations um, is very much appreciated, not only for the people that actually live there and can be like, hey, I know exactly yeah, what know you're talking place, about. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, it adds to the environment. It, it grounds the thing and it makes the atmosphere more um, affecting. You know, it, it, it's it's not a, a fantasy uh, although you're talking about sometimes fantastic themes, right. yes, it's yeah. it's it's someplace that you can imagine that this could happen yes. and yes. would happen. It could yeah. happen on your block, yes, right, that kind of thing. It, it strikes close to home that way, in a way. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I almost can't imagine being in Portland reading the book while yeah. these riots are going on. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It must have been surreal. And, and then, you know, like years later, Brian would send me um, cutouts of articles. Go, look, they attacked City Hall. Look, we, we drew that. We, we we wrote this. Look what's happening. I'm like, I, you're scaring the shit out of me, man. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's get to Masterpiece, which, Masterpiece. which is uh, the next collaboration between mm-hmm. you and uh, Brian Michael Bendis. And that is... Uh, from Dark Horse, mm-hmm. um, and I believe the first issue comes out uh, December thirteenth, which may be when we're going to actually drop this episode. Um, well, first of all, tell me tell me about it uh, and and what it's about and why maybe it's different. Uh, and hopefully, it is different. I, I read that it's a little lighter than uh, Scarlet. Yes, much 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 lighter, much more. And and he sold it to me that way. Um, I I think he wanted he wanted us to take a change of direction uh, and and do something more main not mainstream but but broader you know and because we did go very dark with Scarlet mm-hmm. so um, we made a turn for masterpiece um, I agreed to do it of course um, and I don't know how much I can tell you about the book without spoiling it. But um, probably I'll touch on the surface and say that uh, the book is about a young 16-year-old girl called Emma, and and Masterpiece is her nickname. And she's a a brilliant student in the school, uh, has his own uh, webcomic, which online uh, became very popular, and then allowed her to pay for school and actually be pretty wealthy in in a 16-year-old kind of way. Uh, however, though, it turns out that she's the daughter of two um, famous um, thieves who have committed uh, 
a number of crimes and stolen money from different places, it robbed the casino, um, uh, stole money from a billionaire who is the uh, villain in the book called Zero, and Zero finds Emma and demands that the money is paid back to him um, by Emma, and um, but we don't know what's going on with her parents. Like I, I'm trying to figure out what to tell you, what not to tell you. Uh, anyway, so uh, the, the book is about uh, Emma trying to get back the money to zero. She's trying to find out what's going on with her parents who have disappeared. Um, much more I tell you, I'm, I'm divulging into spoilers, I suppose. So um, there, don't there's want some spoilers. <laughs> yeah, I don't, want, I don't want to do spoilers. Like, I don't want Brian to call me and go, What the hell did you tell him? Why did you tell him that? Uh, but we, we had a whole bunch of, and I'll send you the links to the, we had a whole bunch of uh, press releases where it more or less tells you uh, what is going on in the book without unveiling too much of, of uh, what is about to happen. So um, I think it's, uh, again, I'm using um, a friend of, of my son. Uh, she is playing the 16-year-old Emma. Uh, so she's a real person too. My son is grown up enough, grown up enough to be um, um, a character of the book. A uh, bunch of my friends around me also play a part of that book. So it's again real people. Yeah. So we're using the same formula. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To make that too. <laughs> it sounds so it's gonna, to me it's going to be as real as possible, but much much brighter than than Scarlet. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like a um, it's like a high kind of straight ahead adventure. Yeah, it's adventure. It's like a heist book, you know. It's it's uh, right. who's gonna uh, top the other one? It's 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 kind of a competition between um, a brilliant sixteen year old and an older billionaire, and they're playing games with each other, basically. It, it the way you talk about it, and the way you know, it's sort of a, a little bit of a turnaround in tone from Scarlet. It. Um, you sound very enthusiastic about it, like you're having a lot of fun on on the book. And again, I'm trying a different style uh, on this book. Um, I'm not coloring it myself, uh, which I did with Scarlet. Um, so it'll it'll have stylistically, it will be different than than um, my recent uh, works for sure. Are you are you happy with what? what's been produced i mean yes, imagine you yes, are yes yes i am happy yes yeah but i'm still letting the colorist do his own thing and this is a uh mini series right a six issue mm -hmm. mini yes series? so far we have six six issues uh planned yes awesome and and uh, and uh uh young hearing is the the colorist by the way i'm talking about i need to mention his name too great and and, and jo josh reed is the letter of the book Give them credit to all. I give credit to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you guys are a team. Um, what um, are is it, is it sort of dependent on how this does? Is it, are are there pos You know, hesitate to even ask this no, question no, because the book isn't asking. the book I, I, isn't I out know, yet. I know. But... I know what you're going to ask me. I know what you're going to ask me. Uh, I cannot tell you because I don't know. I know the story uh, is contained within six issues. Um, what will happen afterwards? Only Brian can tell. If he has another six issues in him that he wants to tell, then we talk about another six issues. I don't know. It could be, you know, we can end in a cliffhanger and something else happens. I mean, why not? What if what if this becomes a huge success? It's a great book. Why not continue it? We don't know. It, it, this is like you're, you're sending a boat out to, to, to yeah. bring, you know, a loop. Out of 100 boats, one will bring something back. This could be the one. We don't know. We don't know. Well, you don't know, but it's cleverly named so that even if things go completely wrong, you've created Alex Maleev's masterpiece. <laughs> if uh, someone, uh, someone once told me online as I post artwork on Twitter and, and Instagram and someone uh, who was not happy with what I did and asked them why, 
And his answer was, not everything you do is a masterpiece. But this was way before uh, this was the title of the book <laughs> I was going to be a part of. <laughs> so now, <laughs> um, ironically, I'm creating a masterpiece. <laughs> exactly. You can always fall back on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't remember who that person was, but I remember vividly his answer. Not everything you do is a masterpiece. And he's completely right. It's true. But this one is. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> <Fingers crossed. laughs> um, well, Alex, thank you so much for taking uh, so oh, much time with us. Oh, we did an hour. That's amazing. Uh, uh, well, yeah, we we're right, very we're close right. to it. Yeah. Um, you know, cool. we have a couple wrap-up questions. We'll bring it right there. But, um, Go ahead. If you have other, anything else you want to ask me. Yeah, other than... Um, masterpiece and actually you know i was one of your backers on your uh kickstarter um book you had Thank the marvel you. marvel Thank art um, i'm very excited about this book too i i would love to hear a little bit more about it was this your first kickstarter and was this your first um art book it was the first kickstarter and it's the first official art book i had a sketchbook that was printed before which um i don't want to talk about because it's a piece of crap but this uh I'm putting all my eggs in that basket right now. All my marble eggs in that basket. Yes. Um, so hopefully, I mean, I went through hundreds and hundreds of files um, and scans, and I, I pulled out what I thought was the best I could um, give to people. And originally, I wanted this to be only watercolors, nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we talked with... Um, uh with the editors they they felt that probably we should include other things too uh drawings other paintings and such but i wanted to have a book only of watercolors nothing else maybe one day i will which um i still have tons of work i can um i can put in the book but this hopefully uh will feature my best art that i've done so far for marvel Including covers, including pinups, including uh, sketches, including commissions, including designs, pretty much from all corners of, of my career at Marvel. So it's it's like um, this is the big stoop of Alex yeah. Malay at Marvel. <laughs> I've thrown everything in it. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to getting yeah. it and sort of diving in and <laughs> swimming around in your <laughs> in your artwork. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I did have a question about watercolors, um, because that, that's come up, uh, you know, in your work quite a bit and you seem very, um, uh, enthusiastic, enthusiastic about, about yeah. it. Yes, exactly. Um, what is it about watercolors that, um, really, you know, sort of gets you going artistically? Dries fast, doesn't smell bad. Um, it's. It's a risky process because uh, uh, you know you can screw it up pretty easily. You can you, you can cover up, but uh, it, it's hard to, to fix the mistakes that you made. Uh, so it's in a way it's um uh, it's challenging to me because you got to get it right almost on the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, in, it never becomes what you intended it to become. Uh, it, there's always a surprise. So from the very moment on you start working on it, uh, it takes its own life. Basically, it, 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 you know, it takes its own life is the wrong thing to say. It, it, it takes on as its own entity in a way because yeah. it, 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 it does something like the, 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 the pain and, and the water pushes the pigment somewhere. And, and, and it's only for me to control it. So it's a challenging media. People are very afraid of it, but I don't think they should be. Uh, I, I love it because, um, first of all i was never into oils to me that's much much harder to do the watercolors mm -hmm. uh but i love it because you can instantly see what you're doing and it, it i feel connected to it in a way i don't know why it, it, it it's it's not what i did with um printmaking it's completely on the other side of the spectrum of, of art but it's it's gratifying it, it really is and, and you can take it anywhere too it's just a can you know Think can of, of, of watercolors, you can be on the road with them and you can just draw. 
I feel like it, uh, they're much more improvisational, you know, that they're um, because you can control them less, that almost makes it more interesting to work with because you you know what you want to do, but you also don't know that you're going to get there. No, you're not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Find me one watercolor artist that comes and tells you, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Right. <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't think so. But that's a sort of the thrilling part of it, right? That's I mean, you may discover something that you weren't right. thinking of when you started that the water goes and the pigments go where they may and you find well, something may. new. And, and here's the thing. You never know if the results of, of uh, is what I intended to do. You, you would mm. never know that because as, as um, another set of eyes, you'll look at it and go, oh, I really like this or I dislike it, or, you know, whatever your opinion is. But you will never know whether I intended to do this or not. Because always the recipe is one, the result is completely different. Hey, everybody. What do you think of that interview? I thought Alex was a really fun, interesting dude. And you wouldn't know it, but he was actually feeling quite under the weather when we talked. But he soldiered through, and I thought we got a great interview uh, out of him. So big thanks uh, to him for being on the show. I really loved what he had to say about his art style and his career. All of that thing about texture. That's what I really noticed. And I'm glad he brought up that word uh, about his art. It really has kind of these layers to it and this texture that almost makes it like you can, you know, feel it on the page. Um, so that's it, though. That'll do it for this episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits. A big thank you, of course, to our dedicated listeners and watchers. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you're consuming this episode. And as always, we'll see you next issue.